You're now listening to the Real Estate CPA Podcast. Your source for all things real estate, accounting, and tax. Here we reveal our secrets that can save you thousands in taxes, streamline your accounting process, and help grow your business. Stay tuned to hear insightful interviews with industry experts, successful real estate investors, and current clients on what strategies they use to grow their business and how they steer clear of Uncle Sam. Hi, everyone. Thanks for tuning into this episode of the Real Estate CPA Podcast. Today, we're going to discuss how profits from flipping houses are taxed, starting with the dealer status and why the dealer status can subject you to ordinary income tax rates on your flips. Most real estate investors, at least in our network, are considered investors. But a lot of people make the mistake that that they think that because they are a real estate investor or, or they they believe that in their own eyes that they are a real estate investor, that whenever they go and do a flip, whether it's a land flip or like an actual tear down, rebuild or a big gut rehab, you know, whatever you're flipping, that you get to enjoy the same benefits of an investor. And, and I'll, I'll tell you where the, the big mistake typically lies is you've got like a landlord that you know, has a handful of rental properties and they know that if they hold a property for 12 months, they're going to get long-term capital gain treatment. So they go start flipping properties and they hold their flips for 12 months before they sell them. And then they think that because they've held them for 12 months, they get capital gain treatment. But what we're going to go over today is why that's not necessarily the case and how a lot of people doing that end up shooting themselves in the foot or get caught under audit where it gets really painful really fast. Yeah, basically what we have to break down is whether or not you're in the business of buying houses, renovating them, and then basically reselling them right away, or you're in the business of buying properties and holding them for rent. And what's the criteria for being basically a flipper, uh, for lack of a better word, right? And that's called the dealer status and the terms the IRS uses. So basically what it comes down to, there's a bunch of different criteria that could potentially expose you to the dealer status. And yeah, that's what we're kind of go through right now. Before we jump into those factors, let's talk about the differences in tax between real estate investor and real estate dealer. So if I'm a real estate investor, and I hold a property for 12 months, I get long-term capital gain treatment, which means that my gain is going to be taxed at a maximum 20% tax rate, the long-term capital gain tax rates. At least today, that could actually change here in a couple of weeks or even by the time this podcast comes out. But at least today, uh, if I hold a property for 12 months, I get long-term capital gain treatments, maximum 20% rate. I might have the net investment income tax. So that's an additional 3.8% tax rate, but that depends on your marginal tax bracket. And I might also have depreciation recapture. But the point is, is that you get preferential treatment when it comes to taxes as a real estate investor. And if you hold the property for at least 12 months on the flip side, not to be punny, uh, but on the flip side, (laughs) if I'm flipping property and I'm a real estate dealer, then my tax rate on my profits is the maximum of 37%. It's my ordinary tax rate. So whatever tax bracket I'm in, that's the tax rate that I pay. So maximum 37% rate. I also pay a 15.3% self-employment tax on the profits. And then I pay state taxes. So in certain states, you could very easily find yourself paying a 60% tax rate on the profits that you make from your flipping activity. And when you're a dealer, it doesn't matter how long you hold the property. You could hold the property for years and you will still, when you eventually liquidate that property, still be subject to that maximum 37% rate and that 15.3% self-employment tax. So you gotta be real careful with this. And we're gonna go over these factors here, but before we go over these factors, what I wanna talk about is who makes a real estate dealer. So there's three main factors. And then we're gonna talk about primarily for sale which are the additional factors that Tom was just mentioning. So there's three main factors that if you meet all three, your gain from the sale of a, a of real estate property will be taxed at ordinary rates, your marginal tax rates. Factor number one, the taxpayer is engaged in a trader business. Now, what does that mean? Well, if you flip one property and that's all you ever do, you could probably argue that you're not actually engaged in a trader business, especially if the income coming from that one flip is insubstantial compared to all of your other income. 
if you earn a million dollars as a physician and you go and you flip one random house and you make 10 grand, you're probably going to be able to hang your hat on the fact that you're not actually engaged in a trader business. But if you flip one property every year for a number of years, you're going to find that you probably are engaged in a trader business. So you can really only, in our experience at least, you can really only skirt under this rule if it's a one-off flip and you're never really doing it again. So the first factor, the taxpayer is engaged in a trader business. The second factor, the taxpayer is holding the property primarily for sale in that trader business. And we're going to talk about primarily for sale. That's where all these additional factors come into play. The third factor, the sale of the property is ordinary for that business. So if you meet all three of those factors, you have ordinary income treatment, meaning that you're going to be taxed at that marginal rate, that 37% maximum rate, plus that 15.3% tax. So again, those three factors are taxpayers engaged in a trader business, the property is held primarily for sale, and the sale of the property is ordinary for that business. So let's talk about what primarily for sale means. That's where these additional factors come into play. All right. So when you were talking about primarily for sale, uh, we're going to break this down into nine factors. And basically, there's no one specific factor that the tax course will use to help determine whether or not you are a dealer or not. Pretty much factors four and five will take priority. And factors four and five are the frequency and number and continuity of sales and the extent and substantiality of disposition of the property. So basically, what role are you playing in disposing of that property? Yeah, absolutely. So factors four and five, while again, no one factor is controlling. And what that means is if you flip one factor, you're not automatically going to be a dealer. But like what Tom was saying, factors four and five in prior tax court cases have always carried the most weight. So Tom, why don't you run through the nine factors that define primarily for sale? Okay. So the nine factors that define primarily for sale are number one, the purpose for which the property was initially acquired, two, the purpose for which the property was subsequently held, three, the extent of the improvements the taxpayer made to the property, four, that's the frequency and number and continuity of sales, five, the extent and substantiality of the disposition of property, six, the extent and nature of the taxpayer's business, seven, the extent of advertising promotion or active efforts used in soliciting buyers for the property, eight, the listing of the property for sale through a broker, and nine, the purpose for which the property was held at the time of disposition. So again, in order for a property to have ordinary income treatment, meaning maximum 37% tax rate, 15.3% tax, uh, the taxpayer has to be engaged in a trader business. The taxpayer is holding the property primarily for sale and that sale is ordinary for that business. So those are the three main factors. But what Tom just went through, he just broke down the sub factors, the additional nine factors for what primarily for sale means in the second factor that I just ran through. So Tom just went through the nine factors and he just told you that factor four and five carry the most weight. So again, four and five, the frequency, number, and continuity of the sales, the extent and substantiality of the disposition of the property. So those are the two factors that carry the most weight. Now, all that said, when we have conversations with investors about this, typically they've gone to like a boot camp. They've coordinated or, or learned from another flipper in their area. They've gone to some sort of real estate meetup. And everybody always talks about intent. As long as you don't have the intent of being a flipper, then you're good. That's what everybody learns. So what, what do you do? Well, you learn to write like a little statement out that says, I don't have an intent to be a flipper. I'm a real estate investor and hold the property for a long time, yada, yada, yada. Just know that all that's BS. The IRS is not going to buy it. What they look for is objective facts, not what your thought process is or your thoughts. Um, now, objective facts could be recording meeting minutes if you're part of a partnership or corporation and you're meeting on a consistent basis. Recording those meeting minutes, that can actually help. But don't think that just sitting down and writing a little statement out about your intent for the property is going to all of a sudden make you not a dealer. So if you've been told that, press pause and, and go scroll back through or rewind, listen to those nine factors again. Uh, and and reconsider what you've previously been taught. Now, 
factors one, two, and nine are carry the second most weight. So Tom just said factors four and five carry the most weight for what the definition of primarily for sale means. Factors one, two, and nine carry the second most weight. And those are all about intent. So factor one is the purpose for which the property was initially acquired. Factor two is the purpose for which the property was subsequently held. And then factor number nine is the purpose for which the property was held at the time of disposition. But just know again that more weight is going to be given to objective evidence than to a taxpayer's own statements of intent. And that was very clearly laid out by the tax court in Guardian Industries Corp versus Commissioner. It was a 1991 tax court case. So whoever's telling you write down a statement of intent, know that that's a bunch of BS. And we also got to take a look at the third factor that is that is going to be looked at. And that's actually factor number three, which one carries the most weight. And that's the extent of the improvements the taxpayer made to the property. So all, all of these things to be taken into account when determining whether or not the property in question was held primarily for sale. Factor number three carries the third most weight. I think that's what you meant to say. I just want yeah. to throw that in there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that, that is what I meant to say. Yeah, no, and, and, and when you're going through an audit with this stuff too, if you ever get audited for something like this, the IRS is going to request a lot of documentation and they're going to try to make a determination between whether or not you were actively advertising the property for sale or like a good deal just fell into your lap. So that can often be a determining factor when you are defending dealer status or, or investor status, I should say. Absolutely. And that's why documentation is key. You always got to keep everything documented. If you have emails, uh, you have uh, minutes, like Brandon was saying, you're keeping corporate minutes, maybe you're using a corporation and you need to uh, you document what your intent is that can help, uh, help you know, prove uh, what your intent was and you know, how the situation in the sale came to be. Yeah. And, and, you know, if you want to learn more about these factors, we actually dive into them in an article that I wrote on taxsmartinvestors.com. Uh, it is a membership site, but you can subscribe to a 14 day free trial. So go check that out if you want to learn more about the factors. But if you are a dealer, you report your flipping activity on Schedule C and you don't report it on Schedule D. That's a big mistake that we see a lot of people make. They try to report as capital. Uh, that's, that's where you report that's why you report on Schedule D is because you're reporting capital gains rather than business income. And if you're flipping property, it's not capital. You don't have a capital asset at that point. Uh, it's treated like inventory and should be tr it should be put on Schedule C. All profits are subject to your ordinary tax rate and that 15.3% self-employment tax. They're not going to be on Schedule D. Uh, so don't do that. Don't, don't go throw your flips on Schedule D. Uh, if you are in the trader business or flipping, because you're just going to expose yourself to a pretty nasty audit. Um, but on Schedule C, so you're going to report your your gross income as just the total sales price, total sales price plus any any allowances that you've received from buyers or whatever. That's going to be your gross income number. You're then going to back out the cost of the sale uh, as cost of goods sold te technically on schedule C that's where you're going to, where you're going to report all the costs. Now, what are all the costs? Well, the costs are going to be your original acquisition price. It's going to be the improvements, any direct costs and indirect costs that you allocated to this property. So you got to have really good accounting in place as well. We do a lot of accounting for flippers and it's life changing because they can finally track everything and, and their tax returns start making sense. But you got to have really good accounting and you're going to end up with a net income number. But on that cost of goods sold piece, a mistake that we've seen people make is let's say that I, let's say I buy a property and it's December. So I, I, I spend $100,000 on a property. It's December. I don't actually sell the property until January. Where do I report the costs of that property? Where do I report the cost of that property? You're not reporting it. You're not reporting it in that year. You're really holding it as inventory on your balance sheet until the point in time when you do sell and then it becomes cost of goods sold. So everything kind of gets capitalized, well, not capitalized, really just gets held as inventory on your balance sheet until the time comes when it's time to sell. Right, right. Yeah, so, so we've seen people deduct that entire cost even though they're still holding the asset at the end of the year. So in this example, let's say that I bought a property for $100,000 December 1st, I put $50,000 in before December 31st, then I sell it on January 2nd, because nobody does transactions on New Year's. I sell it on January 2nd for 200K. Well, I don't report the 200K on this year's tax returns because I sold it next year. I sold it in January of next year. So the 200K is going to go on next year's tax returns. 
the 150K, my purchase price plus my 50K of improvements should also go on next year's tax returns. But we see people make the mistake of deducting the 150K today. So what does that make? What does that mean? Well, their Schedule C shows a big loss, shows $150,000 loss, business loss. And they're all happy because it reduces their taxable income. They get a big tax refund. But guess what? Next year, what are you going to show? You're going to show $200,000 business income. So now, so now you're going to have to pay a lot more in tax uh, just because you don't have any cost to offset it. You wrote the costs off in the prior year. That is incorrect treatment. You have to you have to match your costs to the revenue. So the correct treatment would be reporting the 200K sale next year, as well as the $150,000 of costs next year. You would report no costs or maybe very minimal holding costs, uh, indirect costs this year. Uh, on your tax returns. You wouldn't report the direct costs and the indirect costs that have been allocated to that property until you sell it, until you sell it. Yeah. And remember, you're going to want to make sure you do that because if you have a huge profit and you wrote off the property last year, that might push you into a higher tax bracket because these aren't reported at the capital gains tax rate. So you don't get that preferential treatment. So like if you have a huge sale, like a million bucks, that could easily push you into the 37% tax bracket and you want to make sure you can deduct the cost against it to try to get that profit down where it should actually be so you're not pushing yourself into a higher tax bracket. The point I'm trying to make here is just all the more reason to make sure that you're reporting this properly because the tax could be so high for you. And and just to close this out, I would love to run through actual numbers of the tax could be extremely high for you. So I want to run <laughs> through that last statement. So let's assume that I buy a property and I put X dollars in and I've got $100,000 of built-in gain. And let's say that I sell the property. Now I'm a dealer. I meet the three factors in that, that I'm engaged in trader business. I'm holding the property primarily for sale in that trader business. And the property is ordinary for that trader business. So I meet the three factors. I'm a dealer. I've got $100,000 of gain. And what taxes am I exposed to? Well, I've got the 37% Marginal. Let's say I'm already in the 37% tax bracket, and then I do this flip. So now I've got a 37% tax rate on the $100,000. So that's $37,000. I also have that 15.3% self-employment tax. So that's another $15,300, which means that my federal taxes are $52,300 on my $100,000 of income. And I live in North Carolina where our top tax rate is 5.25%. So that's another $5,200. So after all is said and done, my total taxes between federal and state, and it's before any ancillary things come into play, my total taxes on this $100,000 is $57,550, which means that my after-tax profits are only $42,450. So the government gives me the privilege of flipping homes, but then they tell me that I've got to give them almost 60% of my net profits, which significantly reduces my ability to roll that cash back into a new product. You can't 1031 exchange flips. So I can't, I can't avoid that way. We're, we're going to talk about on episode three, how to avoid these taxes if you're a flipper. So make sure that you watch or listen to all three of these episodes, but it's a significant tax that's really difficult to avoid and it's painful. But if I'm an investor, if I'm an investor, and let's say I am in the 37% tax bracket, I'm gonna pay the 20% long-term capital gain tax rate on my income. I'm also gonna pay that 3.8% net investment income tax rate on my income because I am in the 37% tax brackets. So now I am subject and in 37% is not the threshold. It's $250,000 of modified adjusted gross income. If you're above 250K modified adjusted gross income, you're subject to that 3.8% net investment income tax on your investment earnings. If I'm an investor, now I have investment earnings. The capital gain income is subject to that net investment income tax, whereas the flipping income is not because it's not capital in nature. It's it's a trader business. So I don't actually have to pay that 3.8% net investment income tax on my flip income, but I do when I sell a rental property. So I sell a rental property for $100,000. I pay a 23.8% tax, capital gain tax. I also pay the North Carolina maximum tax rate of 525 so my total tax rate on this is 29% roughly, which means that my total taxes are $29,000. So 
when I back that out from my hundred thousand dollars of gain, my after tax cash that I get to pocket is seventy one thousand dollars, about thirty thousand dollars higher than if I'm a flipper. So it definitely pays to be an investor, but what we're hoping that you're going to take away from this series is that you can't just write a statement of intent and think that all of a sudden you're not a dealer. You've got to really structure your facts to make sure that you protect yourself from any sort of audit. And, and you got to make sure that you report these things the right way. Absolutely. And you know, something else is coming up the pipeline and we'll, we'll discuss this later is that under the, the Biden's proposed tax changes, that top bracket might go back to 39.6%. And now you're going to have another 2.6% tax on top of that 37% tax bracket. So just all the more reason to you know take this stuff into consideration and make sure that you plan out your business to put yourself in the most uh, tax advantageous position possible. Hey, everyone. Thanks again for tuning in today's episode. Before you go, we did want to remind everybody about the Tax Smart Real Estate Investor Facebook community with over 2,500 members and counting. There are a ton of great conversations taking place right now between real estate investors of all levels. And with the Biden tax changes in the pipeline, this is something you're not going to want to miss out on. To join, go to www.facebook.com slash taxsmartinvestors or search for Tax Smart Investors on Facebook to join today. Thanks for listening to today's show. If you enjoyed the show, please find us on iTunes and leave us a review. You can also email us at contact at therealestatecpa.com with any feedback or topic suggestions. We are always taking on new clients and with the new tax laws in play, you really don't want to navigate this alone. Let us help you save money on taxes and with your accounting and CFO needs. To become a client, navigate to our client page at therealestatecpa.com and fill out a web form with as much detail about your situation as possible. Thanks so much for listening. Have a great rest of your week.